No, yeah. I'm going to put the slideshow on. Hold on. Yes. Right on top. Good. Is that good? Beautiful. Perfect. Beautiful. Now we're gonna go up. I'm going to mute. That's my dad. I love you. Just to know. Just to let oh, you know. Okay. Thank go you. Thank you. I feel very humbled to be a lecturer in this series with such great, great people from all over the world. I know we're supposed to be homebound and not traveling, but this week or the last two weeks, I've tra traveled to Singapore, to an island in the uh, Indian Ocean. I've been to Spain. I've been to South America. I've been to Canada. I can't believe it. Never had to go through uh, airport security, which is great. Anyhow, <laughs> I'm here to talk to you. Uh, this is going to be probably a pretty simplistic lecture compared to the other presentations, only because I'm stuck at home and all my um, K7 computer, all of my uh, equipment that I usually compile a lecture with um, is in New York, and I haven't returned to New York. We left on March the 14th, and I haven't gone back into the city. So anyway, without further ado, we're going to get started. I'm going to talk about using instrumentation to help you diagnose and treat. Uh, this is me. My office is on Fifth Avenue in New York. I have my email here if you want to write anything to me, comments, good, bad, or any information you'd like, uh, feel free to use it and, um, and contact me. Uh, we're going to talk about Man, mo most of the lecture is going to center around mandibular tracking instrumentation. Um, now we're going to track the mandible so that I could show some things about proprioception and other uh, ways that I use to try to break down a lot of initial proprioception patients have so they could reveal their true envelope of motion to me uh, right from the first visit. Anyhow, uh, for those of you who uh, don't know, um, the uh, mandibular, the ray that is part of the myotronics equipment creates between these two forks, creates a, a field where we read this magnet that's placed below the uh, lower front teeth or on the lower front teeth, so we could track it in, in uh, motion. This is a drawing. It's a simple, open wide close in a sagittal view and a frontal view. And you could see that this patient opens uh, 53.4 millimeters on a diagonal and uh, 40 millimeters on a vertical uh, when you look at them. But if you start to analyze the uh, curvature, you'll see that this is superimposed upon each other until you, your, clo your closing uh, arc is red, uh, opening arc is blue. But you could see at this point, uh, 30 millimeters or more, um, the patient starts to deflect in to get his uh, lower front teeth in behind the upper front teeth. Uh, this is very important because this is what we consider a more ideal opening and closing movement. Uh, there is some lateral discrepancy here, but um, this is on initial visit. This is not after any kind of orthotic therapy or any other intervention. And uh, we'll go through this whole uh, sequence of events. Um, now, this is the opening again, same patient, uh, second opening and closing movement. Now you'll see up in these corners, this is their left joint and right joint. Closed here and here. Rest, that means they drop their jaw a little bit and then wide open. And you'll see this patient on both right and left condylar position, they are on the anterior slope of the eminence. And they're, so they're coming from the uh, posterior slope of the eminence 
all the way around to the anterior. But this part of the tracing from here down is when that condyle goes over the eminence. Now you would think if a bone is tracking over that hill, you would see some kind of abnormal movement in the lateral uh, drawing or trajectory tracing, okay? But this is the most physiologic part of this patient's opening and closing movements. Here, he starts to slow down so he could get his teeth behind and reposition his jaw. So we're gonna concentrate on this lower section of the wide opening and uh, we'll get into all the ramifications of this. This is the same patient after we create a neuromuscular bite for him, uh, bite registration, the bite registration's in his mouth and he opens and closes. Now we're talking a better physiological curve, okay? And he's tracking these two lines are closer together. There's not a big snake in here. And this is the position right and left of the condylar heads against the uh, posterior slope of the, of the eminence. Now, a lot of patients or a lot of doctors would say when I show them these x-rays, they say, oh, well, look, look how low that condylar head is. You're taking it out of the glenoid fossa. In reality, and I think um, there was another case earlier this morning when uh, uh, Hamid noticed that they, you, the patient actually had condylar reforming in a, in a better shape rather than have this angle to it. So if this condylar head did not have this severe angle in it, the condylar head would be a tiny bit higher and wouldn't look like it's out of the um, fossa. But remember, this is initially, as soon as uh, the first visit, as soon as I'm, I'm uh, uh, registering the bite registration and checking the joints immediately to make sure they're in good position. Now, this is the patient restoring lorodotic curve. This was the patient before, and you could see his occlusion. He's class two, division two, um, and he is locked behind his central incisors, and he has a nice straight neck. I referred to this patient in my um, interview saying that sometimes we see physiological changes when a patient wears an orthotic for a couple months. He wore an orthotic four months before I retested him. You could see the orthotics between his teeth. He's repositioned, opened a little bit and forward. And you could see the perfect lorodotic curve in his neck. I asked him, well, I'm glad you went to see the chiropractor and the physical therapist to take care of your straight neck. And he says, I never saw anyone. So this is a perfect patient that we all have that you recommend all these other modalities and they don't do it. Anyway, this is a, a little example of how you could eliminate the proprioception to find the true arc. This is the patient's opening and closing and I had him do this a couple of times and you could see he opens in a straight line, which is totally non-physiologic, and closes on that straight line. He, and you'll find this very common in patients that are class one deep bite or class two division one deep bite. They will train themselves to hit this landing pad no matter what you do to them. That is not physiologic. So what I decided to do I took two of these scans, they looked very much alike. And then I thought, well, what am I gonna do to break this proprioception up here of his teeth coming together so he could use or form a more physiologic arc? So what I did was I had him, op I had him open, so he's down here, and I stuck two fingers, that's 20 millimeters between his anterior teeth. Francesca, I hope you're listening because you and I could go to that desert island and I'll show you the way I do it, not with cotton rolls, 
Well, actually, I put my finger in between the patient's teeth. They, they, I didn't record the initial opening. I started when they were here. He closes, he closes, he closes. Then, without telling him, I removed my two fingers. He opened and closed again. Look where he landed. Then he, he panicked when he was up here, and he had to go look for his, his teeth. So he went behind his central incisors instead of being in front of them. That's six millimeters of forward projection just to keep this natural curve, okay? Now, if you're gonna use a deprogrammer uh, and that's connected to the teeth, either with leaf gauge, there's a hundred different ones and Cyril just talked about the Kois deprogrammer, but they're all working in this area. But you could see that the brain is wired to open and close. That program, programming is all through the opening movement. It doesn't start and end with the teeth coming together. That's the proprio or nociceptive input to the brain that actually repeats that same non-physiologic opening for the patient. Now, on this patient, I'm sorry, uh, all of these slides came with animation, but since I'm using uh, 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 a external hard drive to pull this information from, uh, and this isn't the computer that I originally made the uh, uh, presentation on, I'm not gonna be able to show you movement. So this patient starts here. He opens on this, comes down. I put one finger, 10 millimeters, between his front teeth, and he opens, closes on my finger, opens, closes on my finger. Now you could see this starting to break up. He's starting to lose a straight pattern. So now I thought, well, let's see what he looks like if I put two fingers in, five, 10, 15, 20 millimeter open, 21 or two, my fingers are a little big, but look what he did on my second finger. Two fingers between his front teeth. Now he's giving me a curve, okay? Then I removed my fingers and he very carefully went up to his CO again. Okay, this is all to show you that you could break the proprioception, but you have to think about breaking the proprioception down here as well as the noxious uh, nociceptive inputs that you have when you bring your teeth together. Okay, now this was the same patient. Uh, I register everything. This is a bite registration, uh, uh, bite registration notification that it's M5T2 position number four on, uh, of the many EMGs I take in this patient. And he opens and closes. Now that's a lot more physiologic than what he was doing in the beginning, which was a straight squiggly line that went uh, diagonally across the screen. Okay, this is the difference. Here's another patient. His initial opening and closing movement on his teeth and his repeated opening and closing on the neuromuscular bite. And you could see, and this is uh, the same visit. Of course, he was tensed in between before we take a bite registration. But you could see that he's making a much more physiologic opening and closing arc. Now, I think the important thing to realize is that um, why do we have an arc? The bony structure can't dictate a pure arc because you, you have, when you open wide, you're coming from the uh, posterior part of the eminence to the anterior part of the eminence over a lump. So there should be uh, uh, a, a curvature in our tracing, but there isn't. And what's responsible for this uh, muscular uh, uh, muscular controlled sweeping arc movement is called the mandibular sling. 
Dr. Raccobato has gone into this. He beat it in my head. You have the superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx, which is connected to the buccinator muscles through the raphe, uh, pterygoid raphe, and then you have the obicularis oris muscle. Uh, this is the sling in a cross section. You'll see this is uh, uh, the basilar part of the occiput where the posterior constrictor muscle is attached. It wraps around to the raphe, okay? And then the buccinator muscle takes over. And then from here, the obicularis, or it's in, intertwined into the obiculus aris, uh, I'm sorry, obiculus uh, oris muscle. Okay, this is the back, and this is the important part. The superior constrictor muscle is on, the only bone it's actually attached to is here, base, what we call basion when we do a cephalometric x ray. But this is the basilar part of the um, occiput. Okay, so now you have an attachment to the base of the skull through the um, superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx. There's the raphe again buccinator muscle. Now, here's the attachment on the basilar bone, okay? That's the wrapping of the um, uh, superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx, okay? Then you have the uh, pterygoid mandibular band or the raphe that ac actually attaches the lingulum on the lower arch to the hamular notch on the maxillary arch, okay? And then it wraps around further with the buccinator muscle. Oh, okay, let's get the buccinator muscle in. Oh, this is very interesting too, because look how close, I'll go back a slide. Uh, no, it's this one. Remember on, this is the, um, ter this is the, opening to, for the, um, I can't think of it now, sorry. <laughs> we'll get back to that. The buccinator muscle, and there it is. There's the at side attachments of the buccinator muscle on the mandible, mandible and the maxilla. The raphe's back here. Here's your buccinator with your masseter over it, and then into the orbicularisaurus muscle. And there's how the fibers intertwine. Now you could start to see, okay? Now you could see that when we put a magnet here on point B, which is another cephalometric tracing uh, position, okay, that's at the base of the uh, anterior incisors, okay? and the occiput, where you have a muscular sling that goes from here to here. So when this mandible opens, regardless of what's happening in the joint, you could form an arc. Okay. Now, this is a patient opening and closing, very controlled. Again, this, is, um, this was taken, I, I had the ray on the patient, had the magnet in, and I uh, these little marks here and here are the ray that that registers the arc of movement of the mandible by reading the magnet in that field. And when this uh, this had animation also, I'm sorry, it doesn't. And it opens and closes. This is a DMX machine which is a very much like a fluoroscope, only it's done with digital x-rays. And you can see the actual movement of the mandible. Of course, Javier is four steps above this with the CBCT that's connected with the jaw tracking equipment. Now, this is the placement of the condylar heads in CO of that patient. Now, we um, move them and have them repeat their opening and closing movement. And I think we're gonna have, and this is when they're wide open, 
okay? So it shows, shows this patient going from its maximum intercuspation uh, position to maximum opening. And this is when the patient slides, when the patient slides from CO, I asked her to put her edges of her uh, front teeth together and then open and close. And you'll see a much nicer curvature and repeatable position to the edges of her maxillary anterior teeth. We also wanted to confirm this. And again, we confirmed it that, I'm sorry, this x-ray isn't so clear, but it's been taken off of actual x-ray. Um, so she's down on the eminence here. She has close contact with the eminence and the condylar head. And again, there's an angle to this. If this was straighter, she'd be probably two, three millimeters higher, and she would be here with the condylar head. But of course, we know they, they remodel if you take the pressure off of them. And then this is her, the movement with the, with the magnet and what we're uh, circling Bayesian here. So we have a uh, arc movement. This is uh, a, another patient. You could see how exaggerated this is, 51 millimeters opening, which I really don't like in my patient. Fairly good staying on the midline. Of course, this is when uh, one uh, condylar uh, head uh, maybe repositions itself on the disc or some movement. This is also corresponds to this severe, severe S tape, uh, uh, type curve. Now, when we took this patient, we worked them up, tens them, of course. We're, we're monitoring their EMGs the whole time. Uh, the only thing is I narrowed this lecture down to only the tracings. Now, this is his bite. This is his occlusion, arc of closure and opening on the neuromuscular bite. You could see he's five millimeters open and two millimeters more anterior to his, this was his natural habituary, uh, habitual bite on his CO. You understand what's happening here? We're making his neuromuscular bite here. And what does he give us? A perfect curvature with both lines superimposed. Now, this is same patient. I shrunk his, uh, this scan is the bite registration scan. And usually the gains on this are uh, one millimeter square. These are five millimeter squares because I wanted to put it in the same um, magnification of the opening and closing movement of the mandible, uh, the scan one, we call it. So this is his opening and closing on the bite registration, which is here, his original CO, habitual CO, and where he pulsed. He pulsed here when, I, when he was on the TENS unit. And you saw in the previous lecture, uh, Cyril showed the patient pulsing where their jaws jumping a millimeter, a millimeter and a half. Okay, so this is the same thing. We're just showing you how this patient could go from uh, uh, from a non-physiologic arc of closure to a physiological arc of closure. Now these are the two opening and closing cycles. This is the original from CO open and close, and you could see. How, what kind of, of uh, muscle uh, adaption uh, this had to make uh, because of the of landing the gears, landing the teeth together. And this nice, sweet, open movement and close simultaneously on top of each other. This is another patient, straight opening. So what do you expect, uh, expect here? Deep, probably a deep bite patient. They only know how to open and close because they have to land here, okay? And their proprioception of their muscles are geared to open in a straight line, no physiologic movement 
Every joint in the body has an arc or a movement of the part it's moving. The foot goes in an arc as the knee bends. The arm go, could go in a circle almost, okay? Uh, the uh, elbow bends the arm up to do a bicep contraction. It's an arc, it's not a straight line. This is not physiological. Okay, again, what did I do? I put one finger in, he opens on this blue, comes down, he starts to close before he gets his teeth together, one digit, one finger in between his teeth, okay? Bing, he hits there, opens. Then he starts to close again, it's here. Then he starts to close again, it's here. Now, I take, when he opens this time, I put two fingers in. Now, look at this repeatable arc down here is nice and clean, nice and clean. Then I take my fingers out and he starts to close on this path, but realizes that he's not gonna hit his teeth and his proprioception, his muscular patterns come back into play. Now I'm gonna go back to the previous slide because that's what he came in with. And in, in less than two minutes, I had him biting and opening. First of all, he opened 53 millimeters here. He could only open 40 before I start breaking those engrams and uh, the proprioception of his teeth touching teeth and his muscles getting too far closed before um, I start breaking up that proprioception. Okay, <clears throat> now this is a typical uh, uh, bite registration scan, neuromuscular bite registration scan. And I take, you could see here, I take a lot of EMGs. I wanna uh, define this area where I wanna put this patient. Um, uh, this line that goes across is supposed to be his ideal um, vertical dimension. It's uh, a calculation made by the measurements of the front teeth. This, I'm sure there's many in our audience today that would not agree that there's any specific place, but uh, that's where it is. I chose to um, place- Peter, three more minutes. I love yeah. you, but I have Mariano. No problem. The, right there is the place where I chose to put his neuromuscular bite. Then I took a sleep apnea bite on here. Here's the neuromuscular bite. Here's the sleep apnea bite. There's where I chose to place his uh, jaw for sleep apnea. Now, this is his neuromuscular bite, his um, bite for his sleep apnea appliance is here. He's, if this were his natural occlusion, the only thing I had to do to him is open him three millimeters and push him forward two and a half millimeters. This man went from uh, 42, 42 uh, AHI to five just by wearing this appliance, okay? Now, yes, you could say I opened up six or seven millimeters and brought him forward four millimeters. But if you take the relationship of where his jaw should be to where his sleep appliance is, this is a minimal change in his occlusion. And he should not have any repercussions if his teeth were here for um, after he wears the sleep appliance to uh, adjust to his normal occlusion. You don't have to open someone that much or project them forward that much in order to give them a, a better airway. Okay, uh, I'm wrapped up. This is, uh, I, <laughs> I went through it quickly, but I know there's more people that have to speak today, and uh, I'll be tuned in for the rest of the lectures. Thank you so much. Thank I you, really Peter. Thank you for uh, sharing. Um, uh, it seems like it's very close to uh, what other people are doing. And oh, uh, yeah. the only difference is that you're just measuring and you're recording exact positioning. Right. Now, I... I could probably, if I was caught on a desert island with Francesca, I could probably uh, help her or 
uh, she could help me find the bite, and I, I would you, feel You just want to go on a deserted island with Francesca. That's all you want to do. Uh, yeah. Well, the island looked nice that she pictured in her lecture. <laughs> but the whole thing My is, God. the whole thing is, I needed 